Okay, so I'll be talking about um, development work in northern Ghana, where I spent six weeks um, this summer with a grant from IFSC. So this is just a small idea of where Ghana is. We went, I went from London all the way down to uh, West Africa in Tamale, which is the capital in the north of Ghana. <laughs> Um, it's the center in the north, and you have to know there's quite a divide between the north and the south of Ghana, because um, it was the south that was colonized first, because it was um, directly, directly connected to the sea, so the slave trade took place there. So the north is generally far less developed than the south, and even now infrastructure, education, health uh, uh, infrastructure is lacking behind. Um, so this is just the context. Um, the structure for today will be, first I'll be looking at film as an ethnographic method, and then I'll be looking at two case studies. Um, one will be the, a local social enterprise I was uh, doing my field work with, and the other one comparing that local enterprise with an American research organization. So um, first the beginning. It was my first time in Africa. And um, I didn't expect that to be a particularly big deal, but um, I realized how important it was when people kept asking me, is this your first time to Africa? So I immediately noticed there is an, an African identity, um, not just a Ghanaian identity, but clearly an African uh, identity. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, filming in Ghana was harder than I thought. Um, a lot of the times I was stopped when I went into a marketplace and people um, had two main concerns. One was they thought that I would profit from the film or from the photos I was taking. They were worried that I'd be selling them back to wherever I came from. And the second concern was equally important that I was portraying, again, Africa in a negative light. And they were very worried that um, um, the image that was portrayed of Africa in general in the West was negative and they didn't want me to contribute to that. When I said that I'm just filming the market, which is, it's the wealthiest part in the area because it's the, in the urban hub, um, I didn't get a very good response. So this is just one short clip. <laughs> Clearly does not work. Um, what, what, uh, what program is this? Like, how do you use this? Okay, anyways. Well, that would have been a tip. Um, let's hope the others work, because, um, yeah. Um, I have some nice films. Um, so, the context um, of Tamale. Um, as I said, it's the hub in the northern, uh, in northern Ghana. So, there are a lot of NGOs, uh, which is why I went there, because I wanted to fo focus on development work. And all the foreigners that um, are living in Tamale, and most foreigners who are living in Ghana generally, um, are involved in development work. Either they're there uh, um, temporary as volunteers, or as interns, or on a, as a permanent basis. Um, there almost seems to be some kind of um, social tourism going on, and that could be described as a government policy, um, where the government is actively encouraging foreigners to come to the country so to boost their, their economy by kind of combining volunteering work with, I guess, uh, their summer vacation. Um, but that said, although there are a lot of foreigners, there is a, quite a divide between the lives of foreigners and locals. And there's not that much of an interaction um, between the two, which for me, obviously, as an anthropologist, was quite 
difficult to overcome. <coughs> um, so this is the first uh, case study I'd like to focus on. It was a local social enterprise set up by a Ghanaian woman. And uh, I really hope this works because this is a video that kind of explains. The Gisna Yeshiva site was set up by Madame Stella, a Ghanaian midwife who decided to collectivize an activity that is traditionally done by women individually. Shia nuts are collected from the crowd and are then roasted and processed to make shea butter which is used as a substitute for cocoa butter in confectionery or as a base for cosmetics. By pooling the women's labor, they are able to produce and store the processed butter in bulk and sell it to external vendors like the body shop company, where they fetch a higher price than the untreated nuts would at the local market. Okay, so uh, this is the first case study. The NGO um, that I was working with there. And um, um, before I get into uh, the details of the NGO itself, I'd just like to say how I found this NGO to begin with. So I arrived uh, in Tamale. I didn't know anyone there except one friend who coincidentally was working there as well. And so I thought um, I'd go to the local government office and request a list of all the NGOs that are working uh, in the north. And then I could find one that suited me and was focusing on women because that's what I was interested in. Um, that, that was an experience in itself because going there, <coughs> I talked my way all the way up and I, was, I, I spoke to the ice person there who gave me a handwritten list of the NGOs that were there. And I couldn't even, there was no photocopying machine, so I had to take down some of the numbers and addresses, and that's how I finally found this NGO. Um, so now about evaluating how effective um, this NGO was, and, and especially the effects on the identity of the women that um, it was targeting. The women themselves, who I interviewed and spoke with, um, were very, very positive about the project, clearly, because they were profiting from it. and. Um, they were also generally positive of uh, foreign involvement, um, which obviously me as a Westerner coming in asking what do you think of us foreigners, um, it's maybe unsurprising that that would generally be a positive response. Um, but this woman um, told me one story of um, an American lady coming in from the body shop who um, this organization sells their product to. And she saw all these women working there and started crying. And when this lady told me this story, it, it really moved me. And I thought, why, why was this American lady crying? She doesn't have a right to be crying. These women are proud to be working there. This is, this is a great opportunity for them. If she sends that image that what you're doing is actually so horrible, how, how would the women have to feel about that? Um, so. I do think that this interaction between foreigners and locals can have a very ambiguous <coughs> effect. And I'd just like to connect this to cognitive anthropology because the, and psychology. Um, there was a study done in America with um, um, African-American students. And when they were remi reminded of their ethnicity <coughs> for a math test, they performed worse. Whereas Chinese-American college students, when they're reminded that they were Chinese or of their Chinese ethnic origins, um, they perform better. So I do really think, and I've seen this in Ghana, that um, your self-perception <laughs> comes into how you see yourself and how you will act. And I think that's problematic. So now I'd like to contrast this local NGO with um, um, Innovations for Poverty Action, which is not an NGO itself, but a, a research organization. And so let me just tell you a bit more about IPA. Um, their main premise is they see that development work has pros and cons and they try to evaluate well what works, what doesn't from an economic point of view. And considering the postmodern critiques of uh, Ferguson and Asper and others, I think this is a commendable um, approach. The problem is that they're taking it from an economic point of view exclusively, and what I'm criticizing is their methodology, and in fact, I'm, I'm suggesting that 
economics can learn a lot from the anthropological um, <coughs> approach of participant observation. Because what they tend to do is um, a method called randomized control tests. So they will select a community randomly. Uh, within that community, they will again randomly select half who will get the development or treatment and half who will not. That means that you'll have households who will receive some kind of benefits, some kind of essentially handouts, and others won't. Of course, that creates a tension within the community, which is completely being disregarded by this organization. Another problem is that they will then conduct surveys um, to evaluate the progress of their um, development. Um, the problem is that these surveys are not, are not reflective of what goes on. I, I joined on some of those surveys, and it's quite apparent that there is a clear power dynamic between the um, interviewee and those being interviewed. So the interviewees, uh, inter the people being interviewed, will answer in a way <coughs> that they try to second guess the motive of the, the interviewer. So the results they got a lot of the times were inconclusive, and they, they couldn't really take it any further. Whereas I'm suggesting that, and this is here, what economics can learn from anthropology is that we need a contextualized understanding of the person. And having surveys and interviews alone is not <coughs> sufficient to get a true and full picture of, um, of what is going on and what development <coughs> strategies are effective. Um, so I just want to stress that um, there should be some kind of interlink between the two. And um, although anthropology is a lot of the times very critical of development work, if it did want to take a more active approach, maybe this is one way forward. Um, so my conclusion is quite dampening of development. Um, <coughs> I don't think that it's uh, well suited for, to achieve the aims it has set for itself. And I might even argue that um, pure economic investment without the kind of, um, without the language of improving, um, without the language of improving those underdeveloped um, might be less hypocritic and just as effective. And alternative avenues such as opening borders um, are probably strategies that are more effective. Um, but just to finish on a perhaps slightly more positive note, um, I'd just like to show you this film I made um, with, um, um, with music from a local music um, from Ghana in North <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.